Tell me, my lovelies, what do you think makes a real princess? And Madam Crystal Butterfly. And if you have just been loving all these videos I keep on rolling on up, then please like, leave me a comment. And if you have not yet, swap that subscribe button like it owes your money. And don't forget to give that little notification bell a ring. Alrighty, that is enough of the dilla to the dally. Let's get to the good stuff. My lovelies, welcome, welcome, welcome to the second video in my Curse of the Frog Prince special, where I give all of you a peek into my Curse of the Frog Prince stories, which are part of the Butterfly Tales series that I am currently creating. My lovelies, I wish for you to take this moment to think back to the first time you had ever seen a fairy tale princess. I bet she was made to look extremely angelic and delicate, graceful in each and every one of her steps as she thought about the day she would finally meet her prince, which would allow her life to begin and she would get to live happily ever after. You know, the Princess in my story really, really wishes she had it that easy. Today's episode of the Curse of the Frog Prince special is going to be about the main character in the Curse of the Frog Prince stories, Princess Akenyi, who is the princess of a fictional African kingdom called Nweo that has been at war with their neighbor for decades. Meaning, Akenyi, from the moment she could stand up all by herself, had to learn how to fight. This war her kingdom is in with the neighboring kingdom of Baktufo isn't one of those decade long wars that just pretty much takes place only at the border. Where, you know, they would meet up, maybe fight, but not really resulting in too many casualties and not anybody making any headway into the other country. There were times when the neighboring kingdom of Baktufa would be able to get past in Wales border and press very deep into the country, nearly taking it over and resulting in a lot of death. And Wayo obviously has pushed back and were able to expel their neighbor and even entered their neighbor's kingdom during this decades long war more than once. And they were also pushed back. So via how bad this war is, it's like, you gotta be prepared. You never know when the enemy is going to break the border or make it to your capital and slaughter you all. Now, Akenyi was so talented on the battlefield that she gained the reputation for being a great warrior. Many people who learned of her victories on the battlefield both feared and respected her. Her reputation even led to her father having so much faith in her that he allowed her to 
often take command of his armies and lead them into battle. And majority of the campaigns she led against the enemy were successful. Now, all this success eventually led to her having equal authority as her younger brother, the crown prince. This is not one of those stories where, you know, the crown prince sees his sister getting all this respect and having the same amount of say that he does. And, you know, he's the male. He's supposed to have all the say. So he gets jealous and tries to sabotage her. Because he and his sister are thick as thieves. They both respect each other and they try to do whatever they can to help each other. So Miss Thing, because of her reputation, has led to her commanding a lot of position and authority that isn't normally afforded to a princess. Good for her. But this is where I remind you guys, she's still the princess. A princess's role is not to really go out and fight like she's been doing and everything else. A princess's role is to be graceful, elegant, along with being used as a political tool by being married off to a king or a prince, then giving birth to her spouse's children in order to cement whatever alliance was made to benefit her country. Literally, no matter who she is married off to, that king or prince will command for her to take a woman's role, AKA no more fighting, just go eat some quail or something and sing delicately and give birth to my children. I don't care if you reach this reputation as a great warrior and military commander. You do not try to rise above the station that you were born into because you are a woman. A king knows this and she knows eventually she is going to have to say goodbye to authority that she commands because there is literally no way she's going to be able to get out of being married off eventually. Her father also knows this and he knows that no sooner does he have her married off for the benefit of Enweo Whoever he picks will make her absolutely miserable. And as a father, he doesn't want to see his child suffer like that, but he knows there is no getting out of it eventually. So he has been playing around every time the subject of her being wed comes up in court by using the war as an excuse mostly to stall time so she did not have to immediately enter a life where she was not going to be happy all things must come to an end eventually this war between and away and Baktufo. That has been fought for decades, leading to so much bad blood between those two kingdoms was brought to a sudden screeching halt when a new challenger entered into the fray. The person responsible for getting involved in the 
in Wales, Batufo War, was King Ofori, the new king of a country named Tanwa. King Ofori was seeking to build an empire for himself. And after several successful campaigns resulting in him being able to conquer four whole countries, he conquered a fifth by taking Baktufo. How this young king was able to have so many successful military campaigns resulting in him being able to build a small empire so quickly is an interesting story that I'm not telling you about in this video. You're going to have to wait till he gets his own character video, which is coming. But when he took down the Baktufo, Enweo did not know what to do. The reason why they didn't really know how to handle this defeat of their foe has a lot to do with the king of Enweo had not really had any interaction with the king of Tanwa. Combined with, as I said, King Ofori was empire building. And Weo didn't know if they needed to prepare to stop him from trying to take their kingdom next. This caused a lot of tension until a letter for the king of Enweo arrived from King Ofori requesting that the two of them meet. This letter from King Ofori was an offer to create an alliance with Enweo. King Ofori, in his message, basically told the king of Enweo that, yes, he just took out their longtime foe. But he knows taking out Enweo would <laughs> be rather silly. He views Enweo as being more competent militarily, and if anything, Via the size King Ofori's kingdom had gotten, it would be too difficult to try to absorb Enweo as well. He even offered to, you know, submit this alliance by marrying the king of Enweo's daughter, aka Akenyi. After all, he was a powerful king who needed a bride because his first two marriages really did not work out. And the king of Enweo, who was very tired of war and would like to see peace for his country, took Ofori's offer into consideration. But... He did not want to go through with the deal without meeting King Ofori first. Which King Ofori was happy about because he was more than happy to meet with the King of Enweo to, you know, cement things so that they could come to an agreement. So Ofori set the date. They negotiated stuff a little bit before they actually met despite this. And when the day came that the King of Enweo met King Ofori, King Ofori promptly murdered him and launched a surprise attack on Enweo. Okay, y'all, here's where I'm going to lay a few facts on you. One, royals do not technically, when they go to war against each other, murder each other. Most of the time when a king is defeated and his throne is taken, 
they lock that king up somewhere and take all their stuff basically and rule over their kingdom. They don't kill them. But more important than that, when you are at a negotiation to form an alliance or to make peace with each other, you know, etc. You are not supposed to launch a surprise attack. That is taboo. Anyway, Ofori launched his surprise attack, which was militarily a smart move on his part because he was able to catch both Akinyi and her brother off guard and they were not able to get their troops assembled well enough to be able to stop Ofori from taking their kingdom. Akinyi's brother did meet Ofori on the front lines and barely escaped with his life. Now, I'm mentioning how Kenyi's brother barely escaped with his life for a very important reason because this is where we're about to get into the events of Curse of the Frog Prince. When her brother barely escaped with his life, he went back to the palace to collect his sister and other top military people and escape to their cousin's kingdom. Akenyi, in that moment, knowing Ofori was going to take their capital and slaughter a large amount of her people, along with raping a lot of women and other atrocities, decided she was going to protect her citizens by sacrificing herself. She knew King Ofori had expressed a desire to marry her and she was going to use that to her advantage to be able to protect her citizens. Her brother did beg and plead with her to come with him because Ofori committed a taboo that I mentioned before because what he did is not something royals do. So her brother naturally did not trust Ofori not to commit another taboo and do something terrible to his sister. But she understood that, but she also understood what would happen to her citizens if she did not take the chance on Ofori wanting her enough to make a deal. Sadly, my lovelies, what I get to tell you about Princess Akenyi must end right here. But do not worry, you'll get to learn a little bit more about her in my Curse of the Frog Prince special when it continues next week when you get introduced to another character but with that this video is a wrap now my lovelies if you please come with me as we dance into a world of magic